On a clear, calm, sunny day on the edge of a huge natural pit, the festival was gaining momentum. People couldn't help but notice that this year the scope of this event is much greater than before because the year was better than all previous ones. Each family tried to stand out in order to receive the dragon's blessing. This deity is considered the most powerful of all in the area, so people come here to pray even from afar. A couple of locals were discussing the king's generosity in sacrificing so many pigs' heads when they noticed the cake starting to fall off the plate. The superstitious men were very frightened by what they saw. One of them suggested that the pig did it, but the second objected to him, reminding him that she was dead. Panic began to overcome the first, more unbalanced man. Flocks of birds soared up, flying away in fear. This sight acted as a catalyst for panic for the second. Huge pieces of earth began to break off and fall down, leaving behind clouds of dust. The ground began to disappear from under the feet of all the guests who came to the holiday. Screams began to be heard from everywhere that it was an earthquake and everyone needed to escape. The mountains that had previously remained in the basin began to collapse. Stones flew in different directions like bullets. The entire basin and the site of the former festival were covered with a dense veil of smoke and sand. From the thick darkness, the silhouette of a female figure with horns appeared. She was hungry and looked for the dragon cook. Coming out into the light, the girl examined the remains of the festival. A wide variety of food items lay at her feet. Having picked it up from the ground and bitten off a small piece of flatbread, the horned one immediately spat it out. Her eyes filled with anger, and she decided that no matter where the person she needed was hiding, she would find him anyway. The guy shouted in horror that he was not a dragon cook and woke up in a cold sweat. Sitting on the bed and breathing heavily, the young brown-haired man tried to calm down after a terrible dream. The region in which the young man lived was famous as a paradise, and this is not only due to the marvelous views and abundance of products, but also thanks to the well-known unique treasure trove of gastronomy of the Moss family. The high heat licked the sides of the pan as the cook cooked pieces of chicken and red pepper in it. Two delicious plates, one of which contained a salad called Autumn Flower, which is a secret recipe of the family and was famous for the energy of its elegant form and genuine crunch, were ready to be served to the third table. The chef praised the newcomer and ordered the waitress to take and show these dishes to the young master. The young man was sitting at a table, puffing and trying to win a game on the phone. Angry that he had lost, the guy did not seem to notice the waitress, who embarrassedly approaching him, informed him that his order was ready and asked whether he should serve it to her. Suddenly turning his gaze from the mobile phone screen to the girl, he addressed her, which caused the employee, who was about to leave, to break out in a nervous sweat. Putting the phone aside, the brown-haired woman asked to bring him a salad. The cooks looked at each other, trying to figure out who would be dealt this time. But the arrogant newcomer proudly replied that it was he who made the required dish. The main idea of the salad was that chopped radish, chopped easily and quickly, when placed on a plate, would resemble an autumn chrysanthemum. The young master took the chopsticks in his hand and picked up a small piece of radish with them. Taking the piece with his fingers, he turned to the manufacturer of this dish and reminded him of the three conditions that must be met for this salad. But the piece of vegetable he picked up did not correspond to any of these rules, since it was thick, uneven, and could not be called a flower petal at all. Looking at the small slice of radish like a fanatic, he ordered the cook to practice using a knife and repeat this dish by tomorrow. The man, being confident in his creation, was shocked to the core. However, his surprise quickly turned to anger. His eyes became bloodshot, and he began to shout like crazy throughout the kitchen that the guy was only giving orders, and he had never shown his skills. Unable to control his emotions, the new employee rushed at the guy with his fists, accusing him of being crooked, and two other employees barely restrained him from being stupid. Throwing his cap at the feet of the boss's son, calling him a loser, the cook moved to the exit. Throwing over his shoulder that his hopes of working in an establishment with a hundred years of glory were not justified, since he did not expect that the boy would tell him how to cook. The guy called out to him to stop him. Looking into the offended eyes, he boldly admitted that he was a loser. But this had nothing to do with the fact that their family always strives for excellence in cooking. Adding that the newcomer does not respect his own food and is not sensitive to the opinions of other people, therefore he does not deserve to be a chef. Turning around, the man laughed, asking why he didn't deserve it just because of the words of some youngster. The owner of the establishment appeared in the kitchen and asked whether he would believe that he did not deserve the title of chef, if Moss himself said so. Everyone was surprised by the elder's unexpected appearance. Grandfather said he heard the argument and wanted to comment on something. Two other employees, who knew the grandfather firsthand, immediately realized that the matter smelled of kerosene. Looking piercingly into the eyes of his interlocutor, 
The owner noted that his grandson may be a little picky, but this is not the main problem, because the company's reputation is based on excellence, since it does what no one else can do, it makes a culinary ideal. And then the grandfather began to ask questions that led the frantic employee to a nervous stutter. Plopping down on his knees, the once smug man burst into tears. Pressing his palms to the floor, he began to ask forgiveness from Hugh Moss for being wrong. Later, sitting at a table in the backyard, the grandfather asked his grandson to take care of himself. Tim only cheerfully replied that he was a representative of the 28th generation of the Moss family. Grandfather confirmed that his talent and understanding of culinary art are worthy of this title, and he expressed his regret about the unexpected problem. But the grandson replied that even despite his hands, he was not completely hopeless. Jumping up cheerfully from his chair, he raised his leg and stretched it towards the teapot standing on the table. Deftly balancing on one leg, he hooked the kettle by the handle with the toe of the other, and throwing it up, he launched it into the air high up. The teapot spun around its axis in the air. Raising his limb upward on a longitudinal twine, he caught the teapot on the sole of his boot. Not finding words to express his feelings, the grandfather looked at his grandson in fascination. The child's perseverance and efforts forced the old man to shed a stingy man's tear. Standing with a teapot on his leg, the guy rejoiced. At that moment, one of the kitchen employees ran out into the backyard, saying that things were bad. At the news that someone had formed a crowd outside, the teapot fell off Tim's foot and broke. The guy screamed angrily, angry that someone wanted to make a fuss. An expensive car stood in front of the entrance, from which a middle-aged man in a black suit and a loosely dressed guy in shorts and a hooded sweater emerged. The crowd gathered around was indignant because those who arrived in an expensive car knocked down the sign from the restaurant. When falling from a height, a good quality sign with gold letters broke. The man and the guy carefully examined the building. The blue-eyed, silver-haired young man asked the elder if this was exactly what they were looking for, making a snarky comment about how this was some old rotten diner. The man, ignoring the taunt, confirmed that this was what he was looking for. A tear rolled out of his eye as he thought that 100 years had already passed. However, having pulled himself together, he firmly stated that the time had come for the Moss family to pay a huge price for what had happened once. Decisively coming out to meet the uninvited guests, Tim menacingly asked what kind of bastards had created a mess here. Having met the eyes of those who had arrived, the guy was very surprised. His opponents had similar feelings. The brown-haired man's gaze fell on the fact that the silver-haired man was standing on a broken sign. This sight was beyond his strength and was the last straw. The sneaker standing on the letter seemed to be trampling on his soul. Having boiled, as if lava was flowing through his veins, the guy became blacker than a cloud, and in the blink of an eye, with choice abuse, he attacked his newfound enemy. The aggressive attack was complemented by sincere wishes for death, but his attack was completely repelled by the enemy, and apparently it was quite easy for the guest to repel the blow. This state of affairs did not suit Tim, so he said that the enemies would not intimidate them and warned that no one would escape unpunished today anyway. The man clapped his hands, sarcastically remarking on the greatness of the Moss family. At that moment, the head of the family came to the threshold. The elder calmly said that his family always helped those around them, but since those who arrived had broken their sign and were trampling on it, they themselves asked for punishment. The crowd went wild, demanding reprisals against the couple. The elderly man repeated the arguments of the assembled onlookers with a grin, and then he laughed loudly, as if he had heard the funniest joke of his life. But, becoming serious in the blink of an eye, he turned to Mr. Hugh and asked if he remembered the Harris family, who lived in the south of the city 100 years ago. The named place made the elder tense, and the mention of his surname widened his eyes to unprecedented sizes. At that moment, young Moss said that he didn't care who they were and wanted to say something else, but his grandfather stopped him. As if remembering something terrible, the old man threateningly ordered his grandson to shut up. Bowing, the chief told the couple that they were distinguished guests of the Moss family. Tim was speechless at this turn of events. A satisfied man turned to him and asked if he knew the history of their families. One hundred years ago, the city had two leading kitchens, and due to their outstanding abilities, they were regularly awarded royal gold. Just starting his story, the man turned to young Moss and asked if he understood what he was getting at. Both grandfather and grandson quickly realized who was standing in front of them. To the north of the city lived the Mosses, and to the south the Harrises, and these families were friends, if not for the empty and pompous titles, which gave rise to a literally fratricidal war. In the end, the Moss family won, and the Harrises left the country with a humiliating defeat and did not return to their homeland for 100 years. 
After finishing his story, the man shouted loudly for the entire crowd to hear that he had come here today to fulfill the promise made by his ancestors to challenge the Moss family and regain his glory. In light of the new information, the crowd quickly changed its opinion, beginning to side with the arriving rowdies. Tim was shocked that the reputation the family had built over the years was dispelled in an instant. The grandfather's palm lay heavily on his shoulder. The excited crowd did not stop gossiping about what had happened. The pressure of public opinion fell heavily on the shoulders of the old man, who literally became haggard before his eyes. Two representatives of the older generation of once friendly, but now warring families met their gaze. Bowing deeply, the old generation member of the Moss family greeted the guests as old family friends, adding that their family will make concessions. The brown-haired man couldn't believe his ears. Standing up straight, the grandfather said loudly so that everyone could hear that he accepted the challenge of the Harris family in accordance with the promise of his ancestors, and hoped that they would settle their feud in a culinary duel. Then the elder asked what time they would be ready. Grinning, the man said that he was impressed by the nobility. Approaching a nearby table covered with a red cloth and pulling it off, he said that he was ready for a fight right now. The table was equipped with stoves, all kinds of utensils, seasonings and cooking products. The crowd immediately began to buzz about how well the Harris family had prepared and how they looked like they had already won the competition. The grandfather praised the opponent's spirit and began to roll up his sleeves. Tim was afraid for his grandfather since his body had not been listening to him for a long time. But the grandfather calmed the guy down, saying that everything was fine and he still had the strength to cook. However, Harris stopped his opponent, saying that they must first agree on terms and punishment for the losers, stating that if they lose, the Moss family must not only give up their ancestral home, lose the title of winners, and give up the title of the best in the world. After a dramatic pause, the man haughtily added that Hugh should kneel at the same time. The brown-haired man laughed loudly that every year eight out of ten chefs failed under his grandfather, so the Harrises could lose to him as many times as they wanted. But the elder, without hesitation, accepted the conditions of his rivals. Pleased with the answer, the man hypocritically praised those whom he had considered his enemies all his life, and he said that his son Tony would be the representative of the Harris family in the culinary competition, that in their family it is his son who is responsible for the kitchen. After all, after he returned to his homeland, he received the highest qualification as a chef. He sarcastically added that he wants the heirs of the Harris and Moss families to compete in a culinary duel. Hearing this, my grandfather broke into a cold sweat, and Tim was pierced by sharp needles of fear. He clenched his fists, but they still shook. His memory instantly took him back to the day when, sitting outside the doctor's office, the little boy heard the doctor say that he had a rare case of pathology of the forearm skeleton. Because of this, he is unable to perform fine movements compared to normal people and has less strength. The doctor's words pulsated in his head that modern medicine was unable to cope and culinary art was not for him. Seeing the dejected state of the brown-haired man, the silver-haired man picked up the apple and starting to toss it in his hand, said that he didn't know how to fight. Throwing the fruit high up, the blue-eyed man grabbed a huge knife, and while the ripe fruit was in flight, he finally chopped it with one stroke, so much so that falling on the table, the apple opened like a chrysanthemum flower. And while the crowd was shouting about his skill, the silver-haired one said that in cooking, he never loses to anyone. Suddenly, the crowd attacked him with accusations. The younger Harris kept up with the onlookers and added fuel to the fire, saying that the guy had no courage. The brown-haired man frantically searched for words in his head. At that moment, his grandfather approached him from behind, and saving his grandson, he said that the Moss family was surrendering. The crowd became agitated, not understanding how they could surrender without a fight, since it was shameful to kneel in public. Not expecting such an outcome to the century-old rivalry, the elder Harris froze. His son asked again incomprehensibly, thinking that he had misheard. The grandfather repeated, so that there would be no question that they were admitting defeat, and he was apologizing to the Harris family as agreed. Seeing what the old man was trying to do, young Moss tried to stop him. The silver-haired man began to mock the fact that they didn't even dare to have a culinary duel. Removing his grandson's hand from himself, the grandfather said that they must keep their promises. The old man's joints began to tremble, ready to bend. The onlookers, who did not believe that the grandfather would do this, opened their mouths in anticipation. The brown-haired man heard everyone whispering behind him, feeling sorry for the old man who did not have a worthy heir. Clenching his fists, Tim stepped forward, and he declared for everyone to hear that he was not as skilled as his relatives. Falling to his knees in front of the Harrises, young Moss said he was the one admitting defeat, and getting up, he added right to the blue-eyed man's face that he swears that he will personally erase the shame from his family. 
At the very top of a huge skyscraper stood a girl carefully peering down. A satisfied grin spread across her face as she smelled the dragon cook's scent. The long-haired girl jumped down with lightning speed to achieve what she wanted as quickly as possible. Sitting in the kitchen at the table with dishes in the evening, Old Moss was glad that, although he had not cooked for a long time, he still did it well. Picking up a piece with his chopsticks, he put it on his grandson's plate, telling him to eat it while it was hot. He cheerfully stated that after that, he would no longer be able to taste his grandfather's food. But the guy sat, lost in his dark thoughts. The brown-haired man closed his eyes tightly from mental pain and indignation. Unable to contain his anger, he slammed the table with all his might, causing the bowl of rice to overturn. He openly expressed that he was alarmed by how easily they accepted defeat in front of the visiting upstarts, adding at the same time in a trembling voice that he could not believe that his grandfather was expelled from the world of cooking for this. Hugh froze without putting the piece he was carrying into his mouth. He brought his chopsticks down so hard that they hit the stand. However, his face belied his action as it was good-natured and happy as he talked about living his life without any regrets. The head of the family said that he was incredibly pleased with his ability to cook a delicious dish, despite the fact that he was already over 80, so he was happy and could easily come to terms with the current situation. But it was not at all easy for Tim. He felt guilty, because if it weren't for him, everything would have turned out differently. The caring grandfather immediately stopped his grandson's self-flagellation. To clear the teenager's conscience, the old man admitted that he had made inquiries about the visiting boy. Even if the grandfather had not been old and weak, he still would not have been able to defeat this talented young man. Suddenly taking out a small box, he handed it to his grandson, saying that when people of their family retire, they should pass on the family heirloom to the next generation. The brown-haired man looked inside with curiosity. On a soft silk pillow lay a small talisman in the form of a dagger, which was carved from some kind of green precious stone. The elder Moss said their ancestor was a farmer, and he became a renowned master cook within just a few years of owning the item. After all, it was after their ancestor became a royal chef that their family received their plaque. The ancestors claimed that this thing had magical powers, but while it was passed down from generation to generation, there was no evidence of this. Therefore, the grandfather, waving his hand, honestly said that he was only fulfilling the family rules and Tim should also keep this talisman. The guy put the knife on his palm and thought about what an honor he had, but dark thoughts quickly took over again. Considering himself unworthy, he forcefully squeezed the pendant in his hand, causing blood to flow down his fist, slamming it as hard as he could on the table. Out of anger at his useless hands, he sprayed more red liquid, throwing the talisman on the table in drops of blood and spilled rice, the brown-haired man jumped up from his chair and headed out. Leaving the kitchen, he slammed the door loudly. The grandfather looked after his beloved grandson in excitement. Left alone at the table, he thought about how hard it was for this boy. Meanwhile, the blood that got on the dagger activated it, making it glow from the inside. Passers-by on the street stopped at the screams coming from the restaurant asking them to catch the thief. The cooks were chasing the criminal, whose silver curls were developing from running. After losing sight of her on the street, they complained about how fast she was. But what was surprising was not only her speed, but also her audacity to decide to rob in broad daylight, clearing a dozen tables and even taking with her a huge pig's head. Hiding on the roof of one of the temples, the girl examined her prey. Having chosen a pig's head, she swallowed it in an instant. And then she whispered in annoyance that it was still impossible to eat. Addressing the carved statue as the fourth brother, the thief asked why there were so many people here. Expressing her concern, that if she did not find the dragon cook, she might simply be beaten to death. Patting the dragon on the head, she capriciously asked the brothers not to just stand there, but to help her with the search. The wind immediately brought a familiar aroma, and her receptors immediately felt that the dangerous blade was activated, and therefore, the cook was on earth. Thanking the brothers, she jumped down from the roof. It was deep night outside, but the windows of Tim's room were glowing. The guy, lost in his thoughts, lay on the bed. The words of his grandfather were spinning in his head that this knife, a family heirloom, a sign of hope, which he must accept since he is the only heir. The wooden shutters on the first floor of the house slammed. The brown-haired man immediately got out of bed when he heard a strange sound. The guy immediately thought that it was robbers who had entered the house. Taking a baseball bat, he went to check. On the ground floor, in the moonlight, someone was sitting at their kitchen table, gobbling up the food left there. Having finished with the provisions, the uninvited guest was tired and went to bed on a nearby sofa. The young man watching all this with a bat in his hands became angry at the disrespectful attitude of the man who burst into the house 
and decided to teach him a lesson. Sneaking up to the sleeping man, he swung his hand and gathered his courage. And then as hard as he could, he hit his target. A terrible female squeal was heard throughout the house. Not expecting that the robbers might turn out to be a girl, Tim was shy. The owner of the house arrived in time to hear the noise and flipped the switch. The kitchen lit up, showing everyone a girl sitting on the floor with two ponytails of long silver hair, holding her head in pain, and the younger Moss, looking at her discouraged and even dropping the bat from his hands. The girl rubbed the sore spot and glared at her offender. He looked back guiltily, raising his hands in a surrendering gesture. Flashing her golden dragon eyes, she told him to say goodbye to his life. Her left hand immediately began to transform into a scaly dragon paw. From such an unexpected transformation, the guy's eyes almost flew out of their sockets. She wanted to grab him by the chest, but suddenly she saw a medallion hanging on his neck. And then she recognized a dangerous blade in the green pendant. Her eyes widened, and the anger in them changed to surprise. The guy stood motionless, trying to count the girl's emotions. Her hand became human again, and she immediately took the medallion from his chest. Moving close to Tim's face, she sniffed him. Without hiding her joy, the silver-haired girl grabbed the brown-haired man's jacket. Rejoicing at her discovery, while the young man was perplexed, she waved her hand in the air, outlining a circle, which immediately sparkled with gold. The portal opened, the girl cheerfully stepped into it, and with the words come with me, she pulled Tim along with her. The resulting funnel immediately sucked the guy into it, not even giving his grandfather the opportunity to come to his senses. The old man threw his stick to catch his grandson, but the magic portal had already completely hidden the guy from him. Suddenly, a girl's hand appeared from the already closing tunnel. My fingers groped and found a plate of food on the table, and deftly picking it up, they dragged it along with them, accompanied by a distant voice that said that their labors should not be wasted. The vortex funnel disappeared as quickly as it appeared, leaving my grandfather bewildered in the empty kitchen. Looking around, Hugh was horrified to discover Tim's bent aluminum baseball bat. This discovery left him even more shocked by what actually happened here. Flying along the air corridor of the funnel, the young man carefully closed her eyes from the bright light that covered everything around her. It was impossible to see anything from such a strong glow. The brown-haired man crossed his forearms in front of his face in order to somehow protect his eyes from the burning brightness. This helped him open his eyelids a little to try to see something. Pictures of an unknown world appeared before his eyes. His eyes, realizing that he was no longer under the power of the golden portal, widened. Finally, realizing that he was simply falling among the clouds, the brown-haired man screamed in hysterics. Flying headfirst to the ground, he had already said goodbye to life, regretting only that it was all because of some thief, and promised her that after death he would not leave her alone. The girl, with her mouth full, indignantly asked who this guy was sending threats to. Approaching the young man who was hanging upside down, waving the fried leg she was eating in front of his face, she said that even as a ghost, he couldn't do anything to her, since she was not afraid of ghosts. Realizing that he was no longer falling, Tim began to twitch aggressively, demanding that the unknown woman let him go. Smiling radiantly, the long-haired woman introduced herself as his ancestor. The young representative of the Moss family was angered by these words, and he said that they insulted his entire family, since she herself was almost a baby, and then again asked to let the respected person go. Instantly boiling, the silver-haired woman gave the brown-haired man a delicious right hook without even removing the fried leg from her fist. Then, calmly opening a golden pentagram in the air, as if nothing had happened, the girl said that it was time for them to return, while Tim, lying on the ground, cried, regretting his imminent death. Before he could delve deeper into self-pity, he was caught by the collar and dragged somewhere. The long-haired girl flew high in the sky, holding the brown-haired man by the collar. Tim began to be actively indignant that this could have been done somehow differently, otherwise she would strangle him. At that moment, when the young man once again asked to let him go, a terrible huge monster approached him, which had several mouths like nesting dolls, one inside the other. Frightened by an unprecedented monster, the guy began to climb on top of the girl like a drowning man on a rescuer. Not appreciating such closeness with a creature of the opposite sex, the silver-haired girl in anger began to tear his hands off herself, screaming for him to let her go. After a quarrel, they reached their destination, and the girl lowered him to the ground. Having read the sign on the temple with the inscription that this is Toyota's house, Tim remembered that this is the same average dragon glutton child. Having covered the brown-haired woman's cheek, the offended long-haired woman asked who he called a glutton, busily explaining to the guy that she is the goddess of food and not one who eats a lot. While young Moss held his bruised forehead and fumed at the nonsense he was now hearing, a golden glow began to surround him. 
The girl opened the gate with a spell, at the same time transforming into a goddess with two green horns in a white and green robe. Taking his eyes off, the young man was either surprised or drooling at the appearance of the beautiful dragoness. The long-haired woman commented on his stupid look and said that she was the ninth princess of the dragon family. She proudly revealed that she was in charge of the delicacies of the three worlds and owned the Toyota Palace, being the mistress of this place. Winking at her companion, she allowed him to call her Susie. The guy hardly heard her name since all the previous information filled his brain, turning off the function of normal thinking. Before he could come to his senses, Tim saw how the dragoness revealed some kind of contract to him, which she demanded to sign immediately. The young master respectfully addressed the princess, trying to understand what was happening here, but instead of answering, she shoved the contract in his nose, more demandingly ordering him to sign. Deciding to answer the question asked of her, the Horned One briefly repeated her story that she is the goddess of food and is responsible for delicious food among the creatures of the three worlds, and on Earth there is no one better than a dragon cook. And she happily added that she was giving him a rare chance that could change his life. Surprised by the information that the gods also eat, the brown-haired man compared her to the head of the divine canteen. But Susie didn't like this comparison, so Tim immediately received a new blow to his forehead. While he rubbed the area that would obviously later bear a bump, the princess busily discussed why the dragon's cook was considered a revered job in heaven. Immersed in her memories, the horned one did not notice how she blurted out that over the years she had acquired many treasures through blackmail. Realizing that she had blurted out too much, the dragoness blushed and immediately began to deny it, saying that he had not heard anything like that. So wanting to get away from the sensitive topic, Susie quickly said that she trusted the activation of the blade as an indicator that Tim was a good cook. At that moment, the puzzle in young Moss's head came together. He held out his hand to get the princess's attention. But she, tired of the long wait, grabbed him by the sleeve, telling him to stop acting like a mumbler. Driven by deadlines, the silver-haired woman put the guy's finger on the contract. The imprint instantly glowed gold as a sign that the plank document had accepted his signature. Shocked by the misunderstanding, the brown-haired man shouted that it was not he who prepared those dishes. But it was too late, as the princess grabbing the glowing contract showed it to the temple. Bright golden rays illuminated the entire structure. Susie watched the future transformation with delight, while Tim watched with detachment. Pieces of gold leaf fell from the sky like rain, and in an instant, the once beautiful temple collapsed before our eyes. The brown-haired man, who did not expect such a turn, was surprised to note the disappearance of the building, while the horned one almost fainted from horror. Quickly pulling herself together, she began to blame the guy for the fact that Toyota's house disappeared because of him. The guy was taken aback by such presentations because he had no idea how this happened. Trying to understand the situation, the silver-haired one explained that this house changes depending on the characteristics and skills of the new cook, and since this has never happened before, she didn't even think it was possible. Grabbing the guy by the chest, the angry horned one asked how well he could cook and threatened him that she would kill him if he lied. Young Moss replied that he had already told her who cooked that food, not forgetting to remind her how she forced him to sign the contract without even listening. The dragoness puffed with indignation, but she could not object to the guy. At that moment, a divine voice sounded behind her, announcing that the dragon cook had returned. The realization that everyone was already aware made the princess petrify with horror. One after another, the voices of those who were already aware of the news began to sound in the sky. Realizing what kind of trouble she had gotten herself into, Susie turned around angrily and, glaring at the young man, angrily asked what dishes he could cook. The embarrassed brown-haired man timidly replied that he had never cooked anything before. Tears flowed from the dragoness's eyes when she realized that she would simply be killed along with this undercook. At full speed and with a wild cry, something blue was approaching the couple from behind. The creature, whose shape was something between a drop of water and a fish, tearfully complained to the princess about how the guards of the eastern heavenly gates were harassing him while waiting for the dragon's cook. Taken aback, the brown-haired man tried to ask who it was. Grabbing the creature by the cheek, ignoring his objections, she said that his name was Paul, and he was the master spirit of Toyota's house, and they would see him often. Hearing the last remark, the amorphous one looked carefully at the guy. Flying up to Tim, the spirit joyfully asked if he was the dragon's cook. Young Moss replied, pointing to his companion, that according to this evil girl, he was the cook, discouraging Paul and angering Susie. Ignoring the tone in which the brown-haired man spoke, the spirit rejoiced that Toyota's house was saved and asked the guy how well he cooked. 
The sudden awkward silence that followed confused the blue creature. Having learned the truth, Paul clutched his head in horror. Tim explained that he did not want to be the dragon's cook, and the girl simply dragged him here by force. The Horned One did not like this interpretation of the situation, and she angrily began to justify her behavior. Trying to break up an argument that would lead nowhere, Paul shouted loudly, telling him to think about what to do next. The girl started running in circles, saying that the only option left for them was death, since the guy didn't know how to cook anything. Feeling sad, Tim sadly asked Susie to look at his hands because they couldn't do anything sensible. The deity and spirit fixed their gaze on his hands but saw nothing. Then the dragoness decided to use her X-ray vision. Having illuminated his hands, the Horned One saw that the tendons and veins were faulty, so she assumed that he was disabled. Looking at his hands, the brown-haired man's words got stuck in his throat. Accepting the fact that the guy was not to blame for the current situation, the princess said that one heavenly pill would be enough here, so she decided to send him back to Earth before he was torn apart here for not knowing how to cook. Unexpectedly, young Moss stopped the princess. With a conspiratorial look, he placed his hand on her shoulder and asked her to repeat what she had said. Silverhead thought that he simply did not hear her last phrase and repeated that she would send him back to the human world. Looking at the girl with cunning eyes, the guy asked to repeat the phrase that was a little earlier. Not understanding what he needed, Susie repeated the phrase that his tendons and veins were faulty. The eyes of the young man approaching the target became more and more sly when he asked to repeat the proposal that was between the two. The Horned One was quite fed up with this sudden interrogation, but she repeated her words about the heavenly pill. Having heard what he wanted, Tim literally wagged his tail with joy, asking the dragoness where such pills were sold. Silverhead said that while it would be a piece of cake for her to get the heavenly pill, she wasn't sure she wanted to look for it since the guy had caused her too much trouble. Telling the would-be cook to return, the princess opened a portal. Without allowing the young man to say a word, she grabbed him by the windbreaker like a rag doll, and in one movement she pushed his head into the golden tunnel. The whirlpool began to suck the brown-haired man under his cries that there was no need to rush, and he wanted to talk. Feeling that he was flying further and further, young Moss shouted with all his might that he would help with a feast for the guards of the eastern heavenly gates. At that same second, an even more powerful force than the one that pulled him forward pulled him back. Satisfied with her trick, the Horned One pulled the guy out by the collar and slammed the portal shut. With a sly smile, the silver-haired one clarified whether he would really do what he said. Tim looked back awkwardly and confirmed his promises. Approaching the place where there once was a luxurious temple, which is Toyota's home, they saw a small stall, more like a street vendor's shop. The trio, in disheveled feelings, looked at the remnants of their former luxury. Young Moss, not knowing what to do with his awkwardness, muttered that everything was not so bad. Not appreciating such encouragement, Paul attacked the guy with accusations that this type of temple was only his fault. The dragoness promised the young man that if he failed, she would kick his ass. Turning to Susie, the brown-haired man said that although he did not cook in her world, in his world, he never had problems with traditional cuisine. But she was skeptical about such a statement due to his health problem. Looking at his fingers with enthusiasm, young Moss said that he knew many dishes that could be prepared without using his hands. A spirit intervened in their conversation and offered the guy a tour, to which he was surprised, because it's just a small stall. But Paul, smiling ominously, said that this house is a unique artifact of the three worlds and the treasures are located right inside the closet. Reaching for the handle, Tim asked incredulously if this was an ordinary locker. Opening the door, the young man released some smoke, which began to fill everything with itself, making it difficult to breathe and see. Then the guy heard him being told to open his eyes, Having obediently done what he was asked, the brown-haired man was fascinated by what he saw. An incredible world with unprecedented animal inhabitants appeared before his eyes. He began to admire the stunning huge garden, to which the amorphous one did not fail to reproach him for the fact that last time the royal garden was a thousand times larger than this one. Further, the spirit showed him plants that grow in heaven itself. After that, he took the young man to the yin-yang space, where the dragon cook prepares one dish that can be reproduced countless times. At the end of the tour, already salivating from the delicious smells, they walked into a corridor where there were many storage vessels, and Paul warned Tim that only the dragon cook could use all this, because as soon as they tried to put their hands into the process, the food would turn out tasteless. In light of the new information, the spirit asked the guy if he was ready for this. Having made eye contact with the candidate, the amorphous one received an affirmative answer. Having made lightning-fast circles around the newcomer, leaving behind a golden contrail, he performed the initiation ceremony into a dragon chef. 
When the glow of initiation ended, someone's hand lay on the young man's shoulder. Susie congratulated young Moss on the fact that the house was now officially his, and said that she would like to see how he could cook without his hands. At that moment, thousands of recipes for such dishes flew through the guy's head. Filled with confidence, he said he knew what to do. Huge clawed paws shook the ground and broke trees. A rooster of unprecedented size with burning eyes spewed tongues of flame from its beak. The young man ran as fast as he could out of fear, trying to catch up with him. The dragoness and the amorphous one were dying of laughter from the fact that the cooks were beating up the ingredients. Dodging the erupting flames, the hero shouted in tears that it was not a rooster, but some kind of monster. Having found the coward in the bushes, the princess and the spirit roared with laughter, continuing to mock the fact that what kind of cook and ingredients were like that. Finding what was happening hilarious, the horned one said that it was just an ordinary fire chicken, and all generations of dragon cooks with a knife in their hand could get any ingredient, and that they would be very ashamed if they saw their follower now. Tired of her mockery, the brown-haired man sarcastically said that if he didn't succeed, he would simply get hit on the head, but the girl would have a very hard time. Susie didn't like his threats and reminded him that only he could work here and she couldn't help him in any way, but the guy calmly explained that he was not asking for help in cooking, but only in killing this bird. The good-natured sex honestly said that this was not a problem, since the dragon's cooks had many servants who helped with the ingredients, but the horned one did not like these revelations. Enraged like a harpy, the dragoness began to scream about how he dared to force her to help him. The brown-haired woman subtly hinted that this thing, meaning the giant rooster, was already nearby, to which the silver-haired woman continued to be indignant that she would not help in any way. The giant carcass collapsed to the ground under the influence of Susie's divine power. The cook praised the girl as an ideal assistant. The divine daughter did not like this demotion, so she told the speaker to shut up. Ignoring her comments, young Moss began to give them valuable instructions, which angered the already dissatisfied dragoness to the limit. Naively thinking that she had not heard since she was asking again, the guy repeated the task. The horned one's eye literally began to twitch from how impudently this boy behaved with her. But the guy explained that he was asking only because his hands were not capable of doing such work, and Paul began to hold back the enraged princess, ready to tear the cook into small pieces. When all the necessary ingredients were on the table, young Moss checked everything off the list. The caring spirit said that they helped as much as they could, and now, really, everything depends only on the guy. Susie, standing like a shadow behind the hero, frightened him with her demonic appearance. But the girl categorically stated that she would watch him cook. Tim rolled up his sleeves and resolutely began cooking, opening a clay vessel with wine, he poured it onto a pile of dirt. This action upset the amorphous one to the core, and he complained that this wonderful drink was about 500 years old. Putting the mess aside, the cook said that he would now turn to the meat. Taking some herbs, he simply pushed them into the ungutted chicken, and he filled the carcass with them until it swelled. Paul and Susie looked at what was happening in disbelief. Taking the mud he had prepared earlier, young Moss began to smear the chicken's body right in the feathers. The way it looked from the outside made the princess menacingly ask the guy if he knew exactly what he was doing, while the poor spirit could barely restrain the urge to vomit. The brown-haired man explained that since he couldn't use his hands, a knife or even a spatula, he had to find another way to prepare food, and ask them to just wait. And since they could not help him, he told them to at least not interfere. When the chicken turned into a huge ball of mud, the hero summed up that it was almost ready. The dragoness began to get hysterical, saying that it didn't even look tasty, so she didn't want to deal with the crooked-armed boy because it would make her die, while Paul looked dejectedly at the mud boulder. Feeling bad, the spirit said that he needed to go to the toilet. The newly minted culinary specialist forbade him to leave, saying that he, as a chef, could not do without an assistant. The young man unceremoniously grabbed the amorphous man by the head, and bringing him to the ball, he ordered him to warm it up thoroughly, declaring that after that he could open Toyota's house. Despite the fact that Paul did not understand why all this was needed, he tried his best, heating this terrible ball with his rays emitted from his eyes. Young Moss watched in fascination as the outer shell heated up and flames appeared on it. When the fire engulfed the circle from all sides and it became charred and began to burn, emitting black smoke, the amorphous one stopped and embarrassedly asked if he had done the right thing. The culinary master praised the assistant, and said that he needed something else since there would be many guests. Approaching the cabinet, behind the door of which there was a yin-yang space, he asked how much it would cost to reproduce this dish. The spirit replied that money was not needed for this function, 
Taking out a golden crystal from somewhere, he said that it was left by the last dragon cook. At the same time, he explained that immortals who want to eat must pay the dragon's cook with such crystals, since this is a kind of currency, which is the key to activating all functions of the restaurant. He sarcastically remarked that if the cook had done something worthwhile, he could have received this pebble as a reward. Saying that Paul talks a lot, Tim snatched the activation key from him. Having opened the cabinet with the yin-yang space, young Moss put the luminous treasures there, asking in surprise why the spirit did not believe in him, while the latter, standing behind him, pointedly showed him the fakie. Everything around was filled with a dazzlingly bright golden light. The rays, as if alive, walked around the cook, and they concentrated around a huge ball of mud. The young man did not have time to come to his senses when a golden glow, like fireworks, rose into the sky. To each small flash, out of nowhere, two pairs of hands climbed out and began to roll these lights, turning them into large mud balls. Amorphous explained that Toyota's house can not only replicate the ingredients, but also replicate the cooking technique, as these ghostly hands will copy the chef's actions. Taking the spices, the guy sprinkled them on the fireball and the ghostly hands did the same at the same time. The veins in the spirit's eyes bulged with indignation because the guy sprinkled spices on the dirt. The poor man's nervous system could not stand it, and he burst into tears, literally shooting fountains of water from his eyes, wailing that he should not have trusted this boy. Pointing his finger at the mountains of smoking mud boulders, he indignantly asked how these things could even be eaten. Gathering his belongings into a bundle, Paul waved his handkerchief goodbye and, in tears, decided to leave Toyota's house. At that moment, a divine radiance touched his eyes. Frozen with horror, he announced that the guests had already arrived. Trying to save the careless cook, he grabbed him by the jacket and began to pull him towards Susie so that she would send him to Earth to save his life. But Tim, without listening to him, cordially invited the guests to come through. The commander of the approaching warriors was indignant that they had come a long way to taste the coal balls. And looking ominously, he asked if this was a joke. Dripping with cold sweat and stuttering, the poor amorphous one tried to explain that they had some difficulties. The commander did not care about any circumstances, so an angry tirade followed from his lips, ended with an unequivocal threat to demolish the useless stall. Paul tried his best to smooth things over and stop the conflict. At this moment, a voice greeting the heavenly warriors was heard from the direction of Toyota's house. Twirling chopsticks in his hand, young Moss walked towards the guests with an imposing gait. However, due to his feigned steepness, he did not notice the pebble, tripped and fell face first into the ground at the feet of the warriors. They bent down and looked contemptuously at the boy, asking who he was. Lying on the ground, the brown-haired man muttered in embarrassment that he was the dragon's cook. The commander's eyes widened. He couldn't believe his ears, asking how such a brat could be a cook. Rising and brushing himself off, Tim, being three heads shorter than his interlocutor, asked why young people could not have such a status. All the warriors started shouting at the guy, proving their point. Having come to the conclusion that the boy was lying, the commander grabbed the sword and wanted to execute him for lying. Coming out of nowhere, Susie repelled the attack on the cook. As a mistress, the silver-haired woman barked menacingly at those who came, reminding them that they had no right to fight on her territory. The warriors immediately fell to their knees in a deep bow and began to ask the Divine Daughter to forgive them. The main warrior tried to justify himself by saying that the boy was deceiving them, calling himself the Dragon's Cook. Looking at him skeptically, the girl said that she found him herself and asked if the commander was planning to argue with her. Out of harm's way, the warriors decided to take away their commander before they themselves got the worst of it from the princess. But Tim stopped the already departing guests, asking them not to leave, which greatly angered the dragoness who had with such difficulty dispersed these idiots. When those called out turned around, young Moss threw his stick with all his strength at one of these earthen balls. Having hit the target exactly, he punched a hole in it. In an instant, the crust began to collapse and crumble. Pieces of dirt with chicken feathers baked in them flew in all directions. Smiling radiantly as he watched the process, the brown-haired man confidently said that they would like the food he had prepared for them. When all the dirt had cleared away, the observers saw an appetizing chicken carcass, perfectly baked, with a crispy golden crust, exuding a captivating aroma. Salivating from the smell, the warriors discussed in surprise that they could not even think about the contents of these unsightly stones. Taking a deep breath of the pleasant smell, Paul and Susie closed their eyes in pleasure, and the newly appointed chef, with pride, asked everyone to eat while it was hot. Having torn off a small piece to try, the horned one brought it to her mouth. Everyone froze in anticipation of her fateful verdict. Sensing the taste through her receptors, 
the dragoness lit up with happiness. Unable to hide her emotions, she jumped up and down with pleasure, screaming about how amazingly delicious it was. All the warriors, without hesitation, attacked the food like wild animals. Feeling the rich aroma and simply indescribable taste, the servicemen found themselves literally in heaven with bliss. Delighted with this dish, Susie asked what it was called. Tim proudly said that this yummy thing is called heavenly chicken. The guy busily told the recipe and the history of the name of this dish. Suddenly, those who just recently wanted to kill him for lying raised their hands and began to honor the new dragon chef, praising his wonderful food. The warriors continued to throw their hero, despite his indignation due to his fear of heights, which is why the Horned One sarcastically asked them if they really no longer doubted the boy. Overjoyed, the Amorphous One cheerfully announced the official opening of Toyota's house. Looking at young Moss basking in the glory, the Dragoness honestly admitted to herself that he deserved it. Continuing to fly in the hands of the guards, the brown-haired man thought that he must definitely ask Susie for a heavenly pill, since he must heal his hands. At sunset, a satisfied Paul called the princess and the cook to see how much they had earned. The horned and amorphous one simply beamed with joy, while the newly minted cook looked on with an uncomprehending gaze. Seeing the fabulous sum, the dragoness, emotionally, pressed the spirit to her chest so that he, poor thing, was greatly embarrassed to find himself in this position. The heavenly couple explained to the earthly one that this huge silver crystal calculates the profits of Toyota's house, and also collects ratings and comments. The last addition confused the brown-haired man, and he stammered and asked again, thinking that he had misheard. Paul walked up to the crystal and showed a tiny arrow on it, which you need to pull down, like on a touchscreen, and then comments will appear. Having done this, the amorphous one demonstrated on a silver polyhedron countless messages and high ratings given by the individuals who tasted his cooking, all of whom were legendary, those about whom legends are made. Young Mars felt a little uneasy from such enormous pressure, but the princess was always ready to support him, so the sobering click was not long in coming. Silverhead reminded him that she told him how honorable it was to be the dragon's cook here, so he needed to think carefully about the next dish. Putting his paws together and forming a pug, Tim asked if she had forgotten anything. Making a surprised expression on her face, the horned one pretended not to understand what he was talking about. Not expecting such a reaction, the brown-haired man, looking suspiciously at his interlocutor, asked if she had decided to deceive him. Laughing awkwardly, the girl asked the spirit to bring him a jar of snacks, and the guy was extremely surprised when he heard this. Having brought a small clay vessel, the amorphous one took out a large candy in a golden wrapper and handed it to Tim, who, looking at the sweetness, incredulously asked if it would really cure him. The princess flirtatiously winked at the cook, saying that he was underestimating Toyota's house, and told him to quickly take the pill so that they would have another advantage. Paul, with a conspiratorial air, whispered in young Moss's ear that Susie was a famous businesswoman in heaven. This confused the guy even more, who thought about how this information could reassure him. Hugh was sitting at a table in the backyard of his house and was sad. Not knowing where to find the strength to come to terms with the loss, the grandfather constantly whispered the name of his grandson, asking the void where he was. Suddenly, he thought he heard a familiar voice calling him. Turning around, the old man saw no one. Only the wind rustled the leaves on the trees. Hugh exhaled sadly, upset that he had misheard. Raising a glass of tea to his lips, the elder again heard a voice calling him. Suddenly, a golden funnel appeared in front of him, the same one that swallowed up his grandson. The head of the heir appeared from the bright glow. The head of the family immediately bombarded him with questions about where he was and when he would return. Tim sheepishly replied that he couldn't say yet, but asked his grandfather not to worry because he liked it there. The elder was sympathetic to the younger's secret. The only thing he asked was to promise that he would not expose himself to danger and would definitely be fine. The grandfather lovingly touched his grandson's cheek and tears appeared in both eyes. To break up the dramatic moment, Tim said he wanted to show him something. Taking an apple from his pocket and a knife from its sheath, he threw the fruit over his head. From what he saw, salty drops rolled down the old man's cheeks. Memories immediately took him back to the past, when he, with a baby in his arms, listened to the doctor's verdict that this baby had neurological and muscular problems in both arms which would negatively affect his fine motor skills, which simply would not develop. The kid grew up, and when asked what you wanted to become, he always answered with enthusiasm that he wanted to be a cook like his grandfather. Spinning all his childhood in the kitchen next to his grandfather, the little boy tried to repeat after him, but everything was unsuccessful. He was constantly injured and nothing else. Tired of the baby's constant cuts and his worry for him, the man strictly forbade the boy to ever touch knives or try to cook. 
the young man concentrated with all his might, trying to imitate what famous chefs do in the air with an apple. But due to clumsy actions, it fell to the floor, only half cleaned. Confused, the brown-haired man picked up the fruit, promising that he would train more. At that moment, on the other side of the golden tunnel, he was called, and the guy, apologizing, said that it was time for him to go. Finally, he promised that when he returned, he would cook them the best dinner in the world. The portal closed, leaving the old man alone with himself and his own thoughts. Tears streamed down the Elder Moss's cheeks, fixing his gaze on the starry night sky. The old man could not hold back the salty stream, filled with so many feelings that had been accumulating for years, and now, on one day, they decided to all pour out and ease his mental suffering. Giving free rein to his emotions, Hugh stood in the backyard for a long time, raising his head to the stars. A couple of heavenly inhabitants eagerly devoured the divine mud chicken. Having had their fill, they stretched out on a blanket lying on the grass on the riverbank. Amorphous periodically glanced at the waterfall where the new cook was training. He stood under the streams of water, holding the guard's huge sword above his head. Without calculating his strength, Tim dropped the gun, which hit him and sent him to the bottom, which greatly frightened Paul, who immediately flew up to him, asking Susie for help. Having caught the sword, the guy emerged from the water with it, which once again frightened the poor spirit, and then... As if nothing had happened, he returned to his position. The sympathetic assistant excitedly asked the princess if everything was fine with the guy, because he was acting like crazy. The girl calmly replied that since she had done everything to heal his hands, then if he had not started trying so hard, it would have been very ungrateful on his part. And besides, no one is forcing him. He himself understands that for now his hands are useless. They will remain so if he does not train them. Sitting down to continue the conversation, the dragoness said that although the heavenly chicken was delicious, Toyota's house must update its menu, otherwise they would disappear. The silver-haired girl complained that she had invested a lot of money in this boy, because in order to give him more time for training, they moved to Tyre's space, where time flows differently. The princess complained that the owner of this place demanded all her treasures for being here. The horned one was angry at Tyre's super-mercenary owner and at the same time mourned her jewellery, which she had been saving all these years. Tim, who came up behind him, asked Susie not to be angry because he would not let her down. And when his hands were in order, the restaurant would be even better than before. The caring amorphous man, turning to the guy, asked him to definitely take a break when he got tired, to which he replied that he wasn't tired at all, but he needed a little snack and took the apple from the girl's hands. Raising the fruit to his mouth, he didn't even have time to bite into it when he felt his head spinning and his vision darkening, causing him to collapse exhaustedly on the ground. Looking at the exhausted boy, the dragoness thought that although he was not particularly talented, he was really trying. Since they did not have time for the guy to rest, she activated her golden energy and directed its rays at the tired man. When young Moss woke up, he was frightened by how long he had slept and began to scold the assistant for not waking him up. Angry at the downtime, Susie yelled at Tim to train faster with his sword so that he could handle a kitchen knife. Paul watched his boss's success with admiration, who, seeing the support from his faithful assistant, constantly demonstrated to him the presence of strength. The brown-haired man regularly boasted to his empathetic spirit. Once again, young Moss received a bone on the head from a dragon returning from a hunt, who angrily scolded him for enjoying such little things instead of training. Sitting on a blanket and eating the fifth portion of food Susie had prepared, Tim continually praised her culinary abilities, asking for more. While the brown-haired man was chewing, the princess asked him to give him her amulet so as not to waste time. Handing her what she asked for, the cook asked with a chuckle if she was going to give him a new sword for training, but the silver-haired one said that it was time for the knife. Having activated her energy and combined it with the amulet, the girl summoned the sharpest knife of the venerable dragon chef. The entire sky shone with the light of numerous portals. The heavenly couple looked up attentively, while the guy, having closed his eyes from the too bright light, could not even open his eyes. Almost killing the young man, a huge knife fell from the sky, the shape exactly repeating his amulet. To the brown-haired man, who did not understand how such a machine could be used, the helpful assistant immediately explained that the sharpest knife was a great relic and could not be used directly, but only needed to be touched. The spirit told me that you need to think carefully about what you want the knife to look like, and then it will change itself. He wanted to warn about something else important, but froze with disappointment. Seeing how the guy was already running towards the sword, the angry Amorphous shouted to him that he was an ungrateful boy and should return because he had not finished his story yet. 
Having touched the relic, the guy began to imagine different knives, but none of them met his requirements, so he even presented a small pirate blade, which he played with when he was a child, for which he immediately scolded himself. A childhood toy brought back memories of watching his grandfather work, and his mind immediately flashed to the image of the one his grandfather praised the most. Realizing what he needed, the young man shouted the name of this knife with all his might in order to secure his final choice. But instead of turning into something, the giant sword simply disappeared, leaving no trace behind. Frightened at the beginning, the brown-haired man suddenly felt a heaviness in his hand. Looking there, he saw the very cleaver that he had wished for. Pleased with himself, young Moss happily shouted to the couple that he had succeeded, and he had done it. The horned one answered with a grin that the show was about to begin, while the amorphous one covered his face with his hands, shouting at the top of his lungs for Tim to be careful. Before he had time to ask the assistant what this meant and why he needed to be more careful, the guy felt the knife move in his hand. The cook grabbed the handle with both hands, hoping to hold it. At that same second, engulfed in a golden glow, the cleaver soared up, lifting the young man from the ground, who held it tightly in his hands. Having risen high into the sky, the knife flew down with a flourish, and clouds of smoke scattered from the collision with the ground. The empathetic Amorphous was horrified when he saw the imprint of his boss's body on the surface. But Susie, raising her head, saw that after hitting the ground, the knife soared up again along with the cook. Once again collapsing to the ground, Tim had difficulty understanding what was happening. The dragoness approached and began to swear at him for touching the knife without listening to Paul. After complaining about how tired he was, young Moss wanted to take a break and began to unclench his fingers with which he held the handle. The Celestials shouted in panic that he must under no circumstances let go of the knife, otherwise he would lose the chance to control it. The assistant explained that as soon as the guy touched the knife, the so-called taming process began, and if he let go of the knife now, it would mean that all efforts were in vain since he gave up. The princess added that taming the knife as a test of will and patience would last 10 days, but after taming, the chef will be able to control this knife perfectly. Tim whined pitifully, wondering why they didn't tell him this sooner. The silver-haired woman said that the strength of the knife would change and encourage the guy, saying that everything would be fine. The blade began to glow and the cleaver began to twitch again in the guy's hands. A couple of moments later, the most gorgeous bump adorned the tamer's forehead. The next ten days turned into a living hell for the young man, but he held the knife steadfastly. Bending over the tormented one, the dragoness sympathetically asked the amorphous one what day of the test it was. Hearing in response that it was the latter, the girl was horrified. After all, the test of the legacy was approaching, and she was afraid that the exhausted, bleeding Tim would not be able to withstand it. Meanwhile, the golden dragon woke up the exhausted young man. At that very second, remembering about the knife, the subject was frightened to see his empty hands and thought that he had failed the test. Having looked carefully into the man's eyes, the dragon asked him if he was the boy who wanted to control him, putting the guy into a stupor with his question. The huge reptile face said that if the mortal gave in and simply asked him, then he, so be it, would give him part of his power and make him the best dragon cook. The cunning creature chuckled quietly, promising that if the guy made a deal, he would not tell anyone about it. But the brown-haired man resolutely replied that he did not want to. The young chef said that his friends talked about the obligation to pass this test. I also remembered the words of my grandfather, who said that a cook cannot be called a cook if he cannot control his own tools. This answer angered the huge dragon, as he does not like pompous words from greedy and stupid mortals. Ordering the young man to prepare for death, the dragon rushed at him with an open mouth. Tim began to choke on his own blood and scream in pain under the alarmed glances of the heavenly couple. Paul, literally with tears in his eyes, asked Susie what would happen if the boy couldn't handle it, reminding her of how one of the dragon's cooks had gone crazy. The silver-haired girl looked resolutely and expressed confidence that this would not happen. Activating her power, she walked up to young Moss, sat down on her knees in front of him, and touching his head with her hands, pressed her forehead to his. The dragon continued to mercilessly torment the stubborn boy, tearing off his skin, tearing off pieces of meat and breaking bones. Having prepared a huge cauldron of boiling oil, the monster repeated his question. Bleeding and falling apart, Tim, or rather what was left of him, stubbornly continued to insist that he could not give up. Because of this answer, 200 degree oil was immediately dumped on his head. Feeling like he was dying, Tim heard Susie calling his name, saying that although he didn't know what he was going through, the main thing he had to remember was that this was all just a test, which was an illusion, and she was not must be confused with reality, but must find a way out, and she believes that he will definitely be able to do this. 
the dragon was indignant that a mortal could not give up. Shouting that the boy could not defeat him and he would turn him into mincemeat, the huge reptile launched a thousand knives at him. The mention of the processed food brought young Moss back to his childhood when his grandfather would fry shredded raw meat and he would read a book. The little boy enthusiastically shared with his grandfather the cool knife techniques described in this book. And he dreamily said that if he could do everything that is written in this book, he would cook as deliciously as his beloved grandfather. The knives flying at the brown-haired man immediately fell to the floor as one. And suddenly, out of nowhere, water splashed and the reptile roared in refuge at the mortal, scolding him for breaking his illusion. The guy calmly explained that since it was just a trick of the mind and the dragon was not trying to kill him, everything that happened was reminiscent of culinary lessons. The toothy monster objected, because understanding the essence of what is happening and overcoming your fear are two different things. Tim sincerely thanked the dragon for the experience. Realizing that his love for cooking was enormous, the dragon said that the test had been passed, adding that the mortal is ready to be controlled. Having caught onto the word, the brown-haired man began to ask the dragon to repeat the scene with 1,000 knives again. The giant reptile looked discouraged at its interlocutor and summed up that he was crazy. Meanwhile, in the real world, Susie, worried about Tim, tried to revive him, find out if he received her message and demanded that he not die. While the girl was indignant at the futility of her attempts, a paper crane chirped high in the sky and fell like a leaf into her palm. The note said that the one who wrote was aware of the return of the dragon cook, so he would come tomorrow to the feast and take divine dishes. Caring Paul was furious, shouting that the owner of Tyre's space had gone completely crazy and was mocking him because the poor boy's life and mind were now in danger, so what kind of feasts could there be here, and even by tomorrow? This news threw the two heavenly inhabitants into great hysterics. Having transported the cook to Toyota's house, the princess and the spirit, holding their heads, sat and watched as the unconscious guy continued to tightly grip the knife. Amorphous expressed the hope that the guy would cope with this, just like last time, but the horned one could not support him in this, saying that the boy knew nothing about the eight divine dishes, and in general, he had not even trained. Trying to stay positive, the spirit reminded her that Tyre's lease on the space wasn't up yet, so they could go there to train when the chef woke up. This did not help to console the silver-haired one, since even if the young man learns how to cook these dishes, the ingredients that make up them are very rare, and it is impossible to find them in one day. Clutching her head in despair, the princess told Paul to get ready and run, saying that she would take him to the ground where he could escape. But he, grabbing her by the ribbon on her belt, excitedly asked if it was a joke, since what she was going to, to do is a crime against heaven, and if she is caught, she will be killed. While the poor assistants mourned their unenviable fate, the cook at this time, using the abilities of the golden dragon, learned the cooking process from the inside. Wanting to go into more detail, Tim once again ordered the dragon to repeat, and he kept wondering why this boy wouldn't stop, because he had passed the test. But young Moss replied that this was a unique experience, so he could not miss this opportunity. The cunning reptile wanted to get away from the new cook, so he began to say that he had already understood everything, and that he himself had a limited supply of energy. Glancing menacingly at the man who was trying to shirk, the brown-haired man reminded him that since he was the best knife of the three worlds, that meant he had to work. The young man non-stop tried on himself more and more new ways of cooking, forcing the dragon blade to work. The poor reptile, having fallen exhausted, was thinking of a plan on how she could have fewer encounters with this madman, making a thoughtful expression on his face. Tim said out loud his desire to get out of the illusion. Hearing the great news, the dragon became inspired and came to life, promising that he would do whatever the guy wanted if he left. Jumping onto the giant head from above, young Moss ordered the sharp knife to tell about all the dragon cooks who came before him. The huge reptile was surprised by this request, but promised to tell him a little. This option did not suit the brown-haired man at all, so he said that then they would continue training. But frightened, the dragon immediately promised to tell everything he knew. Meanwhile, at Toyota's house, Susie tied the cook's body to a chair and asked Paul to hide himself and hide it, since she was obliged to protect him. Suddenly, a terrible wind arose, which did not bode well. The sky turned crimson gold, opening a huge portal. When the eye-scorching rays subsided a little, a beautiful red sports car and two security guards stood in front of the heavenly couple and a space keeper in sunglasses, a Hawaiian shirt and a huge cigar in his hands came out of the car. Susie was surprised not by the divine clothes, but he said that he had been walking like this for hundreds of centuries because it was more convenient. 
The man in sunglasses pointed at Toyota's house and laughed that he had never seen it in such desolation. Seeing the guy tied to a chair, the keeper sarcastically added that he managed to find out about the cook who had never cooked. Silverhaired and Amorphous were unpleasantly surprised by such knowledge of the deity. Taking a deep drag, the man answered the question that worried them, saying that she herself showed him the way to the house of that old man who cooks quite deliciously. The realization that she was being watched angered the princess even more. Looking at the girl with contempt, the keeper said that he turned to the Jade Emperor when the previous cook died, because the search for a new one was entrusted to such an unreliable dragon like her. Shaking with hatred for the girl, the man said with pleasure that the Emperor wanted to send her to hard labor, to the North Sea, but he allegedly persuaded him to give the Horned One last chance, to prepare those same eight divine dishes. Realizing that everything was a setup and there was no nobility on the part of the keeper here, the silver-haired one said that for now there was nothing here for him to eat. The man was well prepared for his arrival, so he added smugly that he was very prudent. Having ordered the servants to open the trunk, he demonstrated all the necessary ingredients lying there, indifferently noting that if the dragon's cook could not prepare all these dishes, she would go to hard labor. Susie shook with irritation because he had been eating and drinking with her for years, and now he was doing this because no one could cook these dishes since there was not a single recipe left, and the one who came up with it could not rise from the dead. Her hand turned into a dragon's clawed paw, and she said that he might be able to send her to the North Sea, but not before she would beat the crap out of him. With one easy movement, the Guardian blocked her attack, catching the force field, and said that it was very stupid of her. Twisting the dragoness with her own strength, the man said that he was sent by the Jade Emperor, and if she challenged his will, she could end up in the grave, so he ordered her to pray. Suddenly, from behind him, dressed in a Hawaiian shirt, a stern voice was heard, ordering him to let the girl go. Turning around, the spacekeeper saw the young dragon cook, who was no longer tied to a chair, but stood firmly on his feet. Suddenly, the earth began to rise and tremble, as if during an earthquake. Behind Tim, the small street tent began to turn into a huge high-rise building. The Guardian looked at the transformation with surprise, and the assistants with undisguised delight. When the dust settled, it became clear that Toyota's house, instead of the temple it had once been, had turned into a multi-thousand-story giant modern skyscraper. Amorphous literally glowed with love and shed tears of joy. The horned woman's admiration gave way to bewilderment, because even if the cook had mastered the knife, Toyota's house should not have changed so much. Pretending that he was not shying away, the keeper, turning to the dragon's cook, asked if he knew why he had come. Rubbing the bump on his head, the young man replied that while he was unconscious, he heard about the need to prepare eight divine dishes, adding that it would be easy for him. Such a daring answer in the man's opinion angered him, and he advised the boy to learn modesty, noting that he became the dragon's cook by mistake. The Guardian took the time to mention that when he traveled to the human world, he met a young man named Tony Harris, and this guy was much more talented and worthy to hold this position. Memories of the last meeting between the Harrises and the Mosses surfaced in the young man's head, stirring up a lot of negative emotions. So he told his interlocutor that he simply had not tried normal food here, if he says so. In a rage, the man began to insult his opponent and tell him that he would never become a dragon cook. In response to this, young Moss said that it doesn't matter whether he becomes one or not, but today he will show the keeper what a real delicacy is, and with these words, a sharp knife materialized in his empty hand, in the rays of a dazzling golden radiance. The famous dish that the newcomer had to prepare was invented by an ancient culinary master, prepared from eight extremely rare ingredients that were difficult to obtain even for immortals. But after the gods tried this dish, their strength increased several times. Tim asked what would happen if he cooked what the keeper wanted. The man replied with a grin that he recognized the skill of the cook. But this was not enough for the brown-haired man. He declared with an ultimatum that if he prepared eight divine dishes, then the keeper must admit that he was a snaggletoothed slave, and Susie's case should be closed. The man began to sputter with indignation, and all the veins on his face bulged from the scream. Young Moss decided to clarify the situation, so he calmly said that he was sitting at home, not bothering anyone, but the respected princess kidnapped him and brought him here. Starting to get angry at this interpretation of the story, the Horned One immediately blushed when she heard the boy talk about how she healed his hands, so he was going to repay her with a good job in the title of Dragon Chef. Next, the young man continued to express his dissatisfaction with the situation, telling the keeper that he came here,
began blaming everyone around him and demanding that they cook for him. Unable to find an answer, the man remembered the rule that states that the client is always right. But Tim stood his ground, saying that the chef must cook food with his soul, just as the client must feel the dish with his heart. And if he forces him to cook, it will still not be a normal dish. The keeper, knowing in advance what kind of trap he had prepared, agreed to play by the cook's rules, and if he succeeded in preparing eight divine dishes, he would apologize and close Susie's case. Otherwise, he will return the guy's old hands, Tony Harris will make the dragon the new cook, and the princess will be punished twice as severely. At that moment, the enraged amorphous one protested against such bets with all his might. The brown-haired man resolutely caught the guardian's hand, saying that he agreed. Behind closed doors in the office sat a man in a Hawaiian shirt, and his two bodyguards expressed concern that the dragon cook looked somehow strange, wondering if it was too wasteful of the owner to provide him with all the ingredients. But the keeper sarcastically replied that he had not had these treasures for several thousand years, thereby making it clear to those asking that he was deceiving the boy. Looking around the modern kitchen, Paul was surprised because he didn't know that Toyota's house could change so much. Therefore, he told Tim that for greater success, he needed to prepare as many special dishes as possible, and turning to Susie, asked if she could believe that the sharpest knife recognized the boy as its master. Suddenly, the dragoness fumed as if she had come out of the underworld, shouting name-calling because the cook had bet on her double punishment. The blade of the knife flew to the floor as if it were made of paper when the cancer touched it with its claw, the second catching on the guy's nose, which greatly pleased the angry horned one. Paul could not help but laugh that young Moss even thought of using an ordinary kitchen knife to deal with the cancer of the purest soul, because this immortal cancer had such combat power that even the gods could not defeat it the first time. And pointing to the talismans attached to the tail of the crayfish, he added that if the Keeper of Space had not pacified this arthropod with the help of them, he would have suffered much worse. The young man called for his instrument, and in an instant it was in his hand, again shining with golden light. In one blow, the painless death of a glorious warrior came to become the main ingredient of one of the eight divine dishes. The brown-haired man grinned, telling the knife that he did not expect such aggressiveness, to which he received the answer that everything living and inanimate under the culinary instrument turns into food. Having lifted the sharpest one and raised it over the carcass of the crayfish, the cook suddenly stopped. Amorphous asked the guy why he wasn't moving and advised him to hurry up with the ingredients. Unexpectedly, the young man asked the dragoness how valuable this cancer was. The girl replied that it was very valuable because it lived in a jade pond at a depth of 9,000 meters and was unusually strong and rare. Turning the dead carcass towards a couple of heavenly inhabitants, he ordered them to look at it more closely. Seeing densely packed eggs under the tail, they realized that it was a female. With the face of a great conspirator, young Moss asked if they had ever heard of artificial breeding. Having moved to the royal garden, Tim released all the eggs into the water. In the blink of an eye, small crustaceans began to hatch from the eggs, which in a second became adults. Having caught a couple of them with his bare hands, the cook surfaced, rejoicing at the catch. The adrenaline in his blood gave him a feeling of euphoria from this danger. Susie, ecstatic that Toyota's house was saved and they would make big money, grabbed Paul and hugged him tightly to her chest. But, unexpectedly remembering a small detail, she excitedly asked the young man if he had ever prepared eight divine dishes, while the spirit she had not released was embarrassed by his situation. Young Moss proudly replied that no, which angered the princess, who immediately asked him why he was smiling then. But the brown-haired man told her to relax and grab the amulet around his neck. He called out to someone, causing the green blade to glow the brightest gold. A huge reptile in the rays of light appeared next to him. The horned and amorphous were petrified with fear, afraid to even think. Tim immediately scolded the reptile, telling it to make its face simpler, because there was no need to scare anyone here. From such treatment of the great dragon, a couple of heavenly inhabitants were thrown into horror, and their spirits even fell to the ground. A strong radiance spread again, causing the assistants to close their eyes from the brightness. Meanwhile, the huge dragon turned into a small lizard, which, sitting on Tim's palm, asked what he would order her, which discouraged the couple, who were already preparing for death. 